Welcome to the fourth annual NEE special lecture on engineering and society. The selections of topic and speaker for the lecture are made through recommendations by a committee of NEE members and international members representing diverse fields of engineering. And I thank the special lecture committee members and especially Per Peterson, the committee chair, for their excellent work in selecting this year's speaker. The, this lecture series zeroes in on contemporary issues where engineers can play a significant role. Last year, our special lecture featured John Holdren, who spoke on meeting the climate energy challenge. In 2021, Kate Crawford joined us and examined artificial intelligence and how machine learning can inadvertently reinforce systems of power and, and bias. And in 2020, NE member John Slaughter discussed the need to enable all segments of society to engage in engineering and science and contribute to society. In 2023, NE annual meeting theme is sustainability. It represents a combination of technology, human welfare, and protection of our environment. Our aim is to facilitate collaboration among all engineering and science disciplines, including the social sciences and exchange diverse ideas from leading topic experts about new developments in their fields. Engineering a sustainable world requires what I call the three C's, creativity, collaboration, and commitment to building a resilient future for generations to come. Today's special lecture on engineering ecosystems with AI, artificial intelligence, promises to be informative and engaging it offers new perspectives and presents new advances to address ongoing concerns. Equally important, it promises to illuminate new approaches to engineering ecosystems that better integrate human behavior and suggest how new technologies like large language models and privacy enhancing technologies are being applied to these problems. It is my honor and special privilege to introduce this year's special lecturer, Alex Pentland, better known as Sandy, I think, Pandy Pentland. Uh, Dr. Pentland is professor of media arts and sciences at, and Toshiba professor at MIT. He currently directs MIT Connection Science, a worldwide alliance of progressive companies, nations, and multilateral organizations seeking to understand how to create data, analytical and digital network systems that can improve the world. Previously, he helped create and direct the MIT Media Lab, an interdisciplinary uh, research lab that encourages the unconventional mixing and matching of seemingly disparate research areas. Dr. Pentland's ability to connect physical infrastructure with human or social infrastructure has made him a sought after speaker and author. He has served as a member of advisory boards in both the public and private sectors, including the UN Security General, the UN Foundation, Google, AT&T, and Nissan, among others. He was one of the UN Secretary General's data revolutionaries, helping to <coughs> forge the transparency and accountability mechanisms in UN's sustainability development goals, known as the SDGs. His most recent books, published by MIT Press, which focus on the use of data and the interconnectedness of human behavior, include Building the New Economy, which calls for reinventing the ways that data and artificial intelligence are used in civic and government systems, Trusted Data, which describes a data architecture that places humans and their societal values at the center of the discussion, and Honest Signals, which theorizes that subtle patterns and how we interact with other people or unconscious social signals reveal our attitudes toward them. And I would be interested in his thoughts on Zoom versus in-person meetings. You can find more detail about his career highlights in your program. After we hear from Dr. Pentland, NEE member Rodolph Baranju will moderate a question and answer session. Dr. Baranju has been at North Carolina State University since 2013, where he currently serves as the T. Klanhammer Distinguished Professor. His work focuses on, focuses on characterization of CRISPR-Cas systems 
and their applications to bacterial systems, especially for the study and development of probiotics. He spent nine years in R&D at Danisco and DuPont and is a recipient of numerous international awards for his CRISPR work. So let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pentland to the podium. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So I was told I was supposed to uh, rev you all up, do a little bit of education about AI, and talk about how we can expand the focus of engineering to include humans and human societies. Uh, and that's a big order, but we're gonna try it. Um, so, so there we are. The reason you might wanna pay attention other than sort of intellectual interest is this. The Federal Infrastructure Bill, the new one, includes social structure in the definition of infrastructure. In other words, they're saying is, engineering social structure is now part of engineering. Now, that may be a little controversial, but the non-controversial way to put it is this, is when you build a highway, you advantage certain people and disadvantage other people. When you come up with any sort of policy or infrastructure, it has differential effects, some of which are not immediately obvious. And it's saying you should think about that. Now, why did they put that in that bill? Because the failures that we've experienced from not accounting for human social structure and human behavior. For instance, in the pandemic, we had these non-pharmaceutical interventions that just didn't work very well, frankly. You know, my group, which looks at human mobility behavior, uh, became very interested with the epidemiology people. And what we discovered is, is that epidemiology does not include, at that time, models of people. They have antibodies, they have many things, but they don't know where people work, they don't know where they party, they don't know all sorts of things which really matter for an infectious disease. So, so it's now quite a bit better, uh, and uh, I'll show you some simple examples of that. Another is finance. We've spent centuries trying to make our banks so they don't fail. Uh, current market prices bank failure at about a 2% chance. You might want to note that. That's, that's in, you can buy bonds like that, right? Uh, and if you look at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, what happened there was a perfectly healthy bank had a whole bunch of large uh, depositors that were on a, a Reddit channel, right? And they all said, oh my God, take your money out, and they could do it instantly, and the bank failed. So this is something where you've got a social phenomenon driving what was supposed to be a secure financial thing. And I always like the head of uh, uh, Lehman Brothers after 2008 saying we had a 26 standard deviation event. Well, this is, Frank, forgive me, BS. Uh, nothing is 26 standard deviations that we observe in the real world. What it is, is that the equations for risk were all um, compact distributions like Gaussians and not long-tailed ones. And human behavior has cascades. It has preferential attachment, which results in very long-tail events. And their systems ruled that out in the basic equations. Seems like a problem. And then we have perpetual problems where we don't know what to do about inequality, climate change action, et cetera, et cetera. And many of those things hinge not on the technology or the systems that we engineer, but on human behavior. So we need to begin including those. And, and so that's why you should maybe pay attention to this. I also say, don't fall asleep because I put the zingers at the end. <laughs> uh, and, and then we'll have this little discussion where I get crucified over the zingers. We'll see how that all goes. Um, so I'll give you a simple example of what I'm talking about here. And this is sort of where I come from. So imagine that census data uh, of a city that happens to be Istanbul. Uh, you know, how many people live there? What's their wealth, et cetera? But let's imagine we also included where they worked and played. That's not in our census data. So as a consequence, you don't know the exposure of people to each other. You don't know how disease propagates because people are disease carriers, sorry. Um, but it's not threatening data. It's not individual level data. This is like census data. And so 
what could you do with this in the pandemic? Well, we have a paper just recently in uh, communication physics showing that the things that we tried to do to vaccinate people were really not very good. So the little graph over there on uh, the right shows uniform vaccination or random. If you put 1% more input into it, you get a couple percent bang in terms of reducing infections. If you focus on disadvantaged communities and resistant communities, you can get a little bit more. That's the blue line there. But if you look at the patterns of mobility, the patterns of interaction, and remember, people are disease carriers, right? If you look at those and you measure the most central, this is like the standard measure for networks, right? You can, for that same investment, get almost an 8% reduction in infection. It's not private data, it's not controversial. It turns out that this helps the disadvantaged communities more than just focusing on the disadvantaged communities. So it's not controversial that way. And in fact, if you do the sort of optimization that we typically do in transportation networks, you can get almost 10% reduction from that same 1% investment. So we haven't done anything magic here. We've just said, oh yeah, <laughs> people, they're not uniformly mixed, which is the way the equations used to be only three, four years ago. In fact, they have particular patterns, and if you pay attention to the patterns, you can optimize it in a way that has a bigger effect. I don't think it's rocket science. So what I'm going to talk about here is how can we do this sort of inclusion of social structure and engineered systems in a little more sophisticated way. And I'm not going to try and be a psychologist here or a cognitive scientist because I know about half of you would fall asleep. Uh, so I'm going to give you some sort of simple recipes for it uh, that are backed by really firm science. And I'm going to give you examples from finance, science, patents, laws, and cities, uh, which, some of which I hope will be really exciting. And then a way to integrate AI into this in a way that I think is very hopeful, um, avoids a lot of the problems that, for instance, Kate uh, talked about uh, and others, and uh, perhaps offers a way forward. So let's begin with the first thing. So the way most of our disciplines model people is as rational, deductive individuals, okay? That is, we know what we know, and then we deduce an action to do, and we're a little gummed up about it, so you know you can nudge people and stuff. We're not all that great about it. And frankly, it doesn't work really well, except in very limited sort of ways. And the reason is, is that we have social influence. We are strongly, regularly, always influenced what by our peers do. If everybody else is doing X, you think about X really hard, even if you think it's wrong, okay? And if you're not thinking about it too hard, You'll, you'll use it. And it turns out that this notion, um, if you look at it as a group decision-making process, and remember, groups are what we used to be, little groups, 150 people, for hundreds of thousands of years at least. Um, it looks a lot like a, uh, uh, a sort of, kind of, the group looks like a, a multi-armed bandit problem. So there's all these options that you see, and the group, people try this one or that one, and you observe them, and you pick the ones that win as a prior for your own rational process. So it's not saying people aren't rational. It's saying that they're using other people to get a prior about the different sort of actions that are available and how it worked out for those other guys. And that really changes the process from deductive to abductive, it's a research process. It's, it characterizes people as continually looking for new solutions. Um, and there's a lot of strong science about this. Uh, Cognition, which is sort of the leading uh, cognitive science uh, journal. We had a big paper in that that people really like. And in the machine learning uh, literature, you're talking about how do you have uh, cooperative networks of uh, learners trying to figure out best strategies. Um, and what that does is it puts together something that I'm calling abductive, that is known as abductive reasoning, which is to say what you're trying to do is more of a search process with rationality than I already know the facts. So it's incorporating search in the reasoning process. 
And we had a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science that talked about this and about the dynamics of this. Because you can imagine, if you have everybody out there searching around and trying to help each other or hurt each other or hide things, that you could get really interesting dynamics. And it turns out that you can. Um, and what this paper says is what are the conditions under which you can get uh, nearly optimal performance? And what are the conditions under which you get panics, overly strong uh, 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 actors, and other sorts of negative results? And it has to do with inequality. As long as the ability to search and communicate is roughly equal among people, what you get is something that's a lot like the uh, conditions uh, for general welfare and economics. You get everybody prospering from that. But if one or two of the actors are very powerful in their ability to search for things and attract a lot of followers, you get these cascades of behavior that result in really bad outcomes for the group. And this actually gives you the sort of uh, mathematical framework for understanding all sorts of things that traditionally have destroyed our engineered systems, including our voting systems. So you might want to take a look at it. Um, in other literature, uh, we also have published things that talk about the optimality of this type of a thing and what you have to do to get optimal estimates. And this is optimal in the sense of minimum regret, right? So it's a minimum regret search mechanism for distributed cooperating actors. I think it's a pretty good description of people. And in fact, um, actually, let me just go back one point out. So the way I'm going to characterize these distributed search systems, everybody looking for a better job, looking for a better angle, et cetera, and watching each other, helping some, not helping others, right? I'm going to call that social exploration. You may disagree with me, but I'm up here if you're down there. So you know, <laughs> that's what I'm going to call it. You know, come and kick me afterwards. Anyway. So we did uh, an interesting experiment. This is a social science experiment. We got 2,000 world experts, uh, mid-career financial investors, people who handle tens of millions of dollars a day, to pay us to do an experiment on them. We called it executive education. Uh, <laughs> and what we did is we put them through little education, uh, little exercises where we said, Here's the data about a commodity. Predict the price uh, a week, two weeks, three weeks in the future. I mean, these guys are expert at this, right? And then we showed them what everybody else did. And they said, well, if you'd like to change your estimate based on what everybody else is doing, go ahead. And what you see is you see some of these experts are just driven by the numbers. And of course, that's the theory, right? And they actually make a little more money than other people on a typical trade. But a large fraction of them pay attention to what everybody else does, and they do it precisely as a prior for their decision. Okay? They say, well, everybody else is doing it, and that gives me a prior probability for my decision. And those people have lower risk. Now, if you've ever started a company that does like, like a hedge fund or something, which I painfully have, um, what you find out is that the risk is the stuff you really want to pay attention to. Because you can make a little bit of money, a little bit of money, but then if you lose a huge amount of money, you're out of business. So um, the social thing allows these professional managers to adjust the risk. And they do it as deductive reasoning, rational reasoning, times a prior, which comes from the collective. Okay, So that's not a complicated model. And there's a paper about it in a, a physics journal called Entropy, uh, to build into other optimization methods. So optimizing traffic, optimizing financial systems, things like that. So um, this is, gets us to examples of what we're going to do here. So remember, I defined social exploration for you. <laughs> it's the diffusion of ideas and skills between communities. Communities tend to share the same sort of skills. They, same gossip, same culture, et cetera. And, and what you see is you see interactions between communities. Those can be neighborhoods, cities, uh, uh, countries. Interactions uh, see this spillover effect, if you're, that's what they call it in economics, but this leakage of ideas and skills between the different communities. And it's causal. There's lots of evidence about that. So the spread of commerce between communities. 
Acute one is innovation rates in the U.S. states during the 1800s. You look at where the immigrants, it's all immigrants, right? You look at where the immigrants came from. If they came from very different places, they were more innovative. Just like, and, and these are not small effects. These are, you know, R squared, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 effects. They're huge, okay? And as a consequence, they predict GDP growth in cities, neighborhoods, and countries. They do a pretty good job, even after controlling for all the things that you normally sort of think of. So we think of cities like this. This happens to be San Francisco. You know, there's this district, there's that district. We don't worry about the connections between them, again, just like with uh, COVID. You know, well, do the people that go to the green part also go to the blue part? What time of day do they do it? And we had a, a, a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that showed that what people do, and this is actually common sense if you're a cognitive science, what people do is they learn best from people who have the same utility function, from their peers, okay? And, and what this paper in the National Academy of Sciences showed is exactly how that can be quantified using this sort of model and how it deals with non-stationary events and other sort of discontinuous sort of events. And what happens is people change who they're relying on for that prior probability and incorporating that into their estimates. Okay, so as the game changes, they change who they pay attention to. And so this is an example of what San Francisco really looks like. So this is taking transportation patterns. This is private data, but everybody signed off on giving it to us, so it's public. Um, and you can see, like, the green people, uh, so these are transitions between stores and so forth, right? So the green people basically hang with the green people. They don't go where the purple people or the blue people go. The light blue people hang with, uh, we have these tribes in the city that walk right by each other and go to the store next door, not this one, right? And as a consequence, they tend to adopt the same fashions, the same attitudes. In fact, this way of classifying people is some 300% better than demographics. People really try to fit in, they really try to learn from each other. And as a consequence, uh, you get good effects, you get people learning new tricks, learning new things, but you also get segregation. And we published a paper recently in Nature of Communication showing that the way we typically think about segregation is in terms of residential. Oh, these people here live here, those people live there. But in terms of opportunities from learning to other people, more than, slightly more than 50% is experiential, it's behavior. There are cultural barriers that mean that the green people don't feel comfortable in the blue spots. The blue people don't feel comfortable in the yellow spots, and on and on and on. And that is perhaps the largest single factor in communities diverging from each other, but also in communities that are uh, disadvantaged, staying disadvantaged. This type of behavioral segregation actually is one of the best predictors of crime. It's one of the best predictors of reduction in intergenerational mobility. I mean, if you can't be part of the game, you're gonna stay the same as you were, your family was, right? It's only when you get out and around that things change. And so, um, it's not unexpected that you see this sort of pattern, and I'll show you the results. So this is data from 100 million Americans, and what you see, a very typical example, is you see these big spots. Those are places where, you know, you get your coffee in the morning, you go shopping, you get gas. So those are the things you go all the time, and the big arrows are your transitions between them. Remember I just said you get your coffee, you get your gas, you get your groceries, those are the big arrows. But people also explore in all other things around them. So this is physical exploration. It gives rise to something called the gravity model if you average over all sorts of things. But the interesting thing is, is that different people do it differently. People who had trauma when they were kids don't explore very much. They know the world is dangerous. People who were raised in confident families who had examples of people who would go do uncomfortable things, explore a lot more, and as a consequence, the high explorer people make more money over their lifetime, have higher intergenerational mobility, et cetera. 
Now you will, if you're paying attention, say, well, wait, the higher explorer people also make more money, so doesn't that help them explore more? And the answer is yes. It's not a one-way causal uh, phenomenon. It's a, it's a feedback loop, okay? But it, this direction is, again, something like 40 or 50% of the variance. So it's a big lever to pull on. Um, and we've done this on every, con every populated continent on Earth, and it holds almost the same. Just people are people. If you explore more, you come out better. Now, exploring doesn't have to be physical, although it was hundreds of thousands of years ago. It can be in other sorts of ways. Um, but physical really matters still. So this is a paper we just had in uh, Nature Communication. I'll ex takes a little bit to explain it. It's these three panels on the left. So uh, the one labeled April 2019. So that's the city of Boston, and the blue areas are the places where you get people from different socioeconomic classes mixing, okay? So these are the places that are creating opportunity for people. People who come from poor communities get to see what other people do, they get other experiences and so forth. COVID came along, it all disappeared. Everybody stayed put. They started, they had to eat, so they had to go to local stores and things like that. They changed the patterns quite a bit. And when lockdown stopped, it did not go back. It went back some, and that's that panel on the bottom there. So what happened is we took a segregated society and we made it lots more segregated. Not intentionally, of course, but remember our models didn't include human behavior, so we didn't look, <laughs> okay? And we have, uh, uh, I'm involved with the MIT Transportation Initiative. We had a great PhD thesis that he's going to work for the OECD, uh, Nick Karos, and what the question was, uh, there are all these public libraries in Boston that are underutilized, and could they put co-working spaces in some of them? And the answer that he came up with, or the idea he came up with was, can we put co-working spaces that cause mixing between different socioeconomic classes? So it's one thing to put a we work in the rich neighborhood and all the rich people go there, but to do something where, you know, poorer people, lower skilled people get to actually work side by side with other people is dem demonstrated in city after city after city to produce greater income growth for the poorer community. So these were the places where he figured these were the first uh, five that you'd do. It's a very simple type of a thing. The optimization, he had to actually, he got his thesis because he had to produce a different way of doing optimization, but it's not a really radically different thing. You two could do this, right? Maybe even I could do it, I don't know. Uh, so, so we can have interventions where we design infrastructure that improves segregation, improves access to opportunity, improves intergenerational mobility at least by, that's what's predicted by the correlations. Can we do better than this? I think we certainly need to. Let me just show you a recent thesis we had, Isabella Loeza. Uh, she used ONET data, which is data about skills in every job in every town across all of America. And what you found, what she found, is something really interesting, which is that if you start in a job that's a mid-skill sort of job, you know, managing a restaurant, that sort of thing, right? Um, you will never get to a high skill job in your life. You may change jobs lots of times, but you will never move up the ladder to the higher paying, more uh, consistent, uh, regular sort of jobs. If you start in a high skill job, like you're a junior clerk at JP Morgan, you're on the road. You're gonna spend the rest of your life bouncing among high skill jobs. And if you're a low skill person, you're digging ditches or cleaning things for the rest of your life. This is just the data. This is what happens in America. I'm not like, no cultural values here. This is just the way it is. I think this is wrong though, right? We really ought to be able to upskill people. So our educational systems are all aimed at when you're young, because that was what we needed during, you know, the Victorian and Edwardian uh, time. We need people to read and write and be nice little machines. Uh, now we need people to constantly grow and our, our systems for continual education don't work real well. So what are we gonna do? Well, 
there's a hopeful sign, and that is that many recent studies are showing that these large language models help medium skill workers more than high skill workers. So if you're a mid-level sort of programmer, relatively new, it will help you get to real proficiency more than it will help a proficient programmer improve. Well, that's just what we need, right? Sort of lower mid-skilled to get more skilled. We'd like to also get low-skilled to get more. Um, how could these results happen? Well, let's go back to what I told you about humans. The actions that humans choose, their posterior probability of having success, is a function of their rationality, your likely estimate of likelihood, but also your social influence, the popularity of these actions around you. That gives you a, yeah, I should probably do that because it was good for Bill or Jill or whatever, right? And there's lots of papers about this. It's a simple mathematical form. It turns into a Thompson sampling or a bandit problem, and it's a cooperative bandit problem, which has a little bit of a problem because it can cause cascades if you have radical inequality. That's like sort of recounting what I said earlier. And what that means is that we have a potential innovation by having our AIs suggest actions you didn't think of. And that may be what's happening with these medium skilled people, is you know you're sort of new to it, it's all confusing, you don't know your way around, and it says, did you try this, 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 and this? You say, oh yeah, okay, I'll go do that, right? And it's that sort of, what are the possibilities, what do people normally do that moves you from the middle skill to the high skill? This is a hypothesis, okay? It's not like completely dead proven. But I think it's a really pretty good one, and I'll show you some evidence about it. So why don't we build AI that augments human social exploration? So this is the thing that I've been talking about the whole time, right? It's like people finding other ideas, other skills, other connections so that they can make better choices and live their life better. Social exploration, right? How can we do that? Well, one way we can do that is give people hints about what actions everybody else does so that you're not as, as isolated from everybody else and you don't have to rely on Reddit or the school book that you did 20 years ago or, or things like that. And we could estimate that from online uh, uh, conversations. And a little aside is I have an endowed chair uh, that was originally held by Marvin Minsky who came up with the term uh, artificial intelligence uh, as a hack to get the military people to be very, very scared and give him lots of funding, and it worked like a champ, <laughs> okay? Uh, but one of the things he always talked about in the last sort of half of his life was common sense and how AI did not have a common sense. It had deductive powers, as an era of expert systems and, and stochastic things, but um, it didn't have common sense. This is common sense. This is you take the conversations among a large group of people that you hopefully carefully select, and you ask, what do they do? What is the common sense for actions and relationships among this community? And um, a lot of the problems that we have with AI today is, is that this stuff is trained on Reddit. And I, I was like, come on, guys. If you want the common sense of all the people on Reddit, you gotta expect you're gonna get all sorts of garbage, right? <laughs> and it'll be contradictory, it'll be a really mess. On the other hand, if you trade uh, uh, trained on all the physics journals, you might get something that works pretty well for physics. Not, you know, Nobel Prize level, but certainly, you know, graduate student level sort of stuff, and that's what happens. So how do we do that? Here's a little tutorial. Um, my way of thinking about it, but it's also Stephen Wolfram's way, if you know it, so it's like I'm on good company here. We've got a world that's full of words, and there are transitions between the words. And so if you think about all the conversations in the world, it's these sort of loops going around all the words, right? It's like little comets flying around everywhere, right? And what we'd like to do is we'd like to capture those comets, because those are sentences. Those are the things we say to each other. They're the common sense, right? And the way you do that is you build a, a neural embedding layer. You don't have to understand that. It's basically like uh, singular value decomposition or principal components even. What you're doing is you're taking all this stuff and you squeeze it down to sort of the core representation of what's going on. And it gives you a probability in this case because it's on trajectories 
of where's this trajectory that I'm on gonna go next? So if you have the trajectory, the best thing about AI is its ability to, the next word has uh, learn has a probability of 4.5%, so that's most likely. But it could also be predict, which is 3.5, make, 3.2. So it has these probabilities, and what they do is they add noise. So they mix it up a little bit, okay? And um, all these words come together, they have a nice long tail distribution, like everything else with human behavior. Uh, and so there's things way out at the end that are unusual, but are interesting hypotheses. We'll get to that in just a second. And what you do is you just repeat this. You know, the best thing about AI is ability to create. And then you do it again, create worlds, then again, until you hit an end token. Okay? That's what it does. And if you repeat this with a particular context B, that's called the prompt, and you did it lots and lots of times with noise, what you get is you get a probability density of A given B. Well, that's just what we wanted. We want to know what everybody thinks about A in the situation B. That's not, not all that magic. It's not robot overlords. Now you could make this your robot overlord, but don't. I think that's a bad idea, okay? Here's some examples of how you can do it. So these are day traders sophisticated, they have money in the game. Um, and you can look at how many different strategies they consider in deciding what to trade and the amount of money they make. And you see that the blue things are, those are just unaided people. They top out at thinking about, about three strategies. <laughs> I'm gonna do this or this or that, okay? It's not, we're, we're not so smart, okay? But you can augment them and say, oh, well, you know, you do those three, but there's this one and this one and this one, too. And just let the human choose. We're not telling the human what to do. We're just giving them other alternatives. And guess what? They make a lot more money. And they make a lot more money reliably. Until you hit about 10 strategies, and then our poor brains just overheat and <laughs> we lose it, okay? So, so that's interesting. What you're doing is you're saying, okay, well, you want to be in this situation, what are other people doing? Now, professional investors do this too, and they do it to control risk. Day traders do it just because they don't know what to do. Right? There was a wonderful study that just came out of Wharton uh, about brainstorming for under $50, $50 widgets that you could sell popularly, right? And you probably can't see it, but the thing on the left there is uh, humans, and the vertical axis is purchase intent. So they, they had these things, humans brainstorm new products. I need a, a, you know, a cat that grows chia hair or something, right? <laughs> okay? And then they had a bunch of other people sort of uh, audit how, or, you know, guess how, how purchasable this would be. And then the other two columns are AIs, GPT-4 and GPT-4 prompted with a couple of good examples. And they're not so different, okay? And people say, oh my God, GPT is doing just like the humans. Well, yeah, it's trained on humans. This is like Google, like Google search. Google is not smart. Google is packaging what we do in terms of referencing to each other. And it's very helpful, okay? This is really much the same thing. You can even get it to do novelty ratings, right? And I'm just gonna claim this is not proof of creativity. This is proof that most people don't know all of the ideas that are being talked about in the common sense. And if you can remind them of that or make them available to them, it's better. But you haven't take agency away from the human. This is like brainstorming, come up with ideas, some of them you like, maybe you say, ah, let's go get a beer. You know, it's not, you know, robot overlords type stuff. Now, I'm gonna end with a couple of things that are controversial, uh, and, uh, and I'm gonna get myself, like, <laughs> uh, questioned about this. But in many ways, these are the most important. Uh, I've shown you that you can redesign transportation and other sort of systems to decrease uh, inequality, increase uh, uh, profitability of communities, 
intergenerational mobility, things like that. I've shown you a couple Wall Street examples where you could invest more regularly, particularly individuals. I'm gonna show you a couple of other languages, quote unquote, that humans have. One is citations. We all try to get citations, right? Write papers, like, oh, I've gotta get a lot of citations. It's an important paper, right? Or we do patents, and you want your patent to be cited because that says you've like gotten there first and everybody else building stuff on top of you, right? That is a type of language. It's very much like Google Search. Google Search works primarily on the links between things. These are the links you put at the end of your paper between your paper and other papers. Okay? So that's actually a type of language that we have for saying where is this paper situated in the ground of science or engineering or whatever. An even more basic one is RNA. I mean, you know, there are all these different creatures out there and we share a lot of RNA and, and the RNA and DNA do different things that we don't quite know, uh, but there you are. Um, that's a language too. And you would expect the same tools to work. And they do. <laughs> so citations, you know, there's this wonderful distribution of things, I mean, maybe you've had like one of the super hits. It seems to be a little bit random. But let me show you an example of all the citations in an area of physics, okay? And this is over a century, what you're gonna see. And there'll be a little star in the middle, which is a paper that was published back in the late 30s about ferromagnetism, and it got zero citations for 50 years and then all of a sudden it took off like a rocket. And the things I'm gonna show you are all the other papers in this same embedding space. Got it? So a little movie. So there's all the papers, there's the star. It looks like an amoeba searching for good places in the space of science. So this is a 40 dimensional space of feature space, of, oh, sorry, embedding space. You can't put names on the features. But what you see is as the years go on, people you know, push a little further, they go off to one side, they go up. When they go up, that blue star gets, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of citations. Okay, so science is like an amoeba searching for better things to do. You know, we publish papers, you get citations, you feel good, you go do something else there. People actually behave in terms of this exploration, exploitation thing, so when you get a hit, you do more things like it, because you figure, okay, I'm gonna get known for this. This is what people do across the whole field. And when you're not getting hits, you tend to try newer things, because you know, you're not, not do it, feeling so good about it. What's interesting here is that, so this is the top 25%. Uh, you can predict, based on that thing I just showed you, which papers will be uh, in the top 25% of all citations, 10 years out, 15 years out, 20 years out. You can also predict with a little lower accuracy whether it'll be in the top 10%. Think about that. If I could tell you where you were gonna have maximum impact, likely, this is all stochastic, right? Wouldn't you pay attention to that? Maybe NSF, I was talking to a gentleman earlier, maybe NSF should start funding based on the amoeba is going this way, <laughs> okay? What's really interesting about this is there are other areas where citation language is used, like for instance, patents. You have to cite other things, right? Turns out you can predict which patents are gonna be highly cited. Same type of thing. So you could, for instance, say, well, if I wrote a paper like this, would it get lots of scientific papers and lots of patent uh, uh, citations? That might be a good thing to do, right? Uh, law is a citation thing too. When they make a decision, the judge makes a decision, he cites other things. Turns out that language can be interpreted in the same way to predict which things will be landmark decisions. And I don't know if it's good or bad that judges know whether their thing they're working on is a landmark, but you know, you can do it. There's other things you can do with judges too. Um, and this is the one that's gonna get me in trouble because I have a world expert here who's gonna grill me. But um, one of the things that I've been interested in for a long time is microbiomes. Uh, microbiomes are hard because there are millions of little creatures in there and they all have RNA and we only know a few of them and God knows what they do as an ensemble, right? So it's tough. Um, but 
one of the spin-offs that we have, um, went and looked at the microbiomes of cows, <laughs> 2,000 cows from, for a few years, and sort of asked, what was the character of the microbiome? And what did that have to do with the growth of the cow, production of methane? And it turns out that when you look at the little fragments that you get out of uh, the first steps of this, so we're looking for 30 mirrors here, which are much longer than people usually use, what you find is you find there are these clumps of RNA. You don't know what our animal or what little bug it belongs to, but they always co-occur. And when they, some of them grow, then other ones get smaller, they have these dynamics on them. So there's little functional clip, uh, uh, pieces of RNA in there. They're not so little, they're 30, 30 base pairs long. Um, and what that does is it gives you a sense of the dynamic, functional dynamics in the microbiome. Oh, wonderful, good science, what do you think? Well, but it also turns out <laughs> that you can tell which cows are gonna produce methane eating what food, okay? So um, just across these 2,000 cows that you can reduce methane emission by about 14% to give a sort of context. That would, if that was done on all the cows, that would be about two, 3% of all uh, greenhouse gases in the world. So it's not trivial. I'm not, that's cool, I like that, right? But you could also do this to humans. You could say all those vitamins and things you're taking, <laughs> we don't know what they do. Uh, but they do change your microbiome, and that has some unknown effect. Uh, you could do the same thing on people. That would really be transformative. Okay, so take home messages. Um, it is a good thing to improve social exploration between communities using knowledge of the social interaction. Everything from infection rates, to innovation rates, to intergenerational mobility. All of those things depend on this uh, as, a, as a principal causal element, not as the only one, right? And it is a complex situation, it's a feedback loop. Um, and it seems to me that it's a natural way for AI to be used is to help people understand more opportunities, more facts, what other people do as a common sense engine to help upskill people. And it, it seems like that's also something that's a little safer than a lot of the things that people do because it's not taking agency from the person. It's providing them with, well, you know what everybody else does is this. Now you can make up your mind about it. There are ways, of course, to present this where people you know, are, uh, are dragged into it against their will. But it's probably a safer channel for doing things and I think it's something we really need to do to have continuous learning become a standard part of our society. And uh, got to advertise the books, building the new economy. That's uh, how all these sort of AI and blockchain and everything else things are interacting with uh, uh, data and how we can are beginning to, to take hold of it. And, and actually, I, I will brag just a little bit that you know I see several countries. We work with a variety of countries, several countries beginning to use the things that I talked about there. And then the basic sort of like. Uh, computational social science, understanding humans at scale, which I've given you a little taste of, is my older book, Social Physics, uh, which some people like uh, because it actually does the sort of things that you're talking about. Other people say, wait a second, I'm not influenced by other people, I'm all by myself. Uh, and to that I sort of say, yeah, you think so? <laughs> I don't know about that. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good. All right, thank you, Sandy. Um, great thought-provoking presentation for sure. I hope everybody enjoyed the special lecture as much as I did. Uh, we're gonna transition to the Q&A portion uh, and segment of that particular session. We have two microphones uh, across the aisles here. If you come to the microphone and you have a question, please state your name and ask your question, and I will moderate time as much as possible. Maybe I'll start with the first question as people Good. line up and digest what you just said. Um, engineers have their own social biases. Uh, a lot of people on selection committees yesterday spend their day together with each other. And obviously we're here on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon uh, spending time with engineers at the NAE uh, talking about engineering. How can we use social structures and biases 
as individuals or as a group of engineers uh, to address some of the challenges that lie before us, either when we advise the nation, when we educate the next generation of engineers, when we work with non-engineers in business and our academia. How can we actually, factually uh, do our job better? Well, I think that the top level thing is, look, we have a tradition of building devices or systems, and it's just the device or the system. It's going to cost this much, take long to do it, it'll last this long. Um, but all of those systems have impact on society also. So, you know, the obvious ones that we've been, uh, had our arms twisted about are things having to do with pollution. So, like, if you build this and it turns out that poisons the river, that's not so good. And, and you have an obligation to think about that beforehand. And what I'm suggesting is you also need to think about um, some of these other things, like what is the effect on the communities? And we've seen some things that I would posit as disasters, <laughs> small to, but disasters, uh, that come from not thinking about that. And uh, what I'm trying to say is, is, look, there's good engineering ways to do this. There's simple models of human behavior that account for cascades and a lot of the things that we find frustrating about people. And you can put that into your optimization procedures, just like you put in weathering or microcracks. Or, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that we put in. Um, the example I showed with Nick Carlos and, and creating work, uh, co-working spaces is a good example of that. So he's trying to think about transportation patterns and how can they change transportation patterns so that it gives more opportunity to the poor neighborhoods, right? So along with making it shorter, making it more efficient, making it safer. So it's more cri optimization criteria, basically. Um, and in, I mean, you know, the, the, the very top level thing is, is that there's lots of things that we've done recently, financial systems, transportation systems, uh, uh, you know, health systems that really don't have a model of human in there. They don't uh, recognize that their social structure and the th intervention that they're proposing has real effects. And they need to just sort of put that in there and turn the crank. Uh, and that would be my, uh, my suggestion. Nice, great. We'll start on this side, please, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, my name is George Belfort, and I'm a professor at RPI. I'm over here. Oh, OK. I just want to tell you I loved your talk. Thank you very much. Um, so my question is, uh, you t spoke about social diffusion. These ideas diffuse. Can you tell me if the rate of diffusion is related to diffusion of molecules? Uh, diffusion coefficient of molecules, as you know, goes yeah. as the square root of time. And I'm just wondering if these ideas move similarly or differently. The, the evidence is that it's um, similar. It, it, unlike molecules, it's not a fully mixed system, of course. People no, don't understand. talk to everybody else. I'm just wondering how they diffuse. Uh, no, it's very much like molecules. It, and, and, you know, the sort of top level thing, top level simplest models are these models called gravity models, which are pretty much exactly the same thing. They assume that there's real mixing and it's just like the molecules. Uh, but that there, but diffusion is limited by distance, right? Mm -hmm. So it diffuse, it falls off, sure. you know, in that exponential. But the next most sophisticated thing says, but, but you, these people have already talked to that, so it actually diffuses within communities right. also. Your idea that we need to include data with um, human ideas, of course, you know, uh, and everybody knows, this was uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman's idea for noise and for movement and for the idea. And I like that a lot. Uh, I've thought about it a lot, and I think that we really need data to support human ideas, but you need also human ideas to, to make the data fit the system. Absolutely. You, if you don't use that, you don't have a, a system. Anyway, I can talk later with you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. So that was my comment, is if you train on Reddit, you're going to get Reddit quali quality comments and common sense. If you train on uh, a physics journal, you're going to get a very different sort of product out of that. And then the noise is in, in the production of these things is important so you get a sense of the local probability distribution uh, around a topic. I'll go on this side of the room, please. Hi, I'm Julie Thornfield from Caltech. And uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, 
possible contradiction to something you said. You, you said that improving social exploration is a positive good. And after George Floyd, we had a little bit more exchange of information about, for example, how safe it is to live in Pasadena. So one of our colleagues, who's a Howard Hughes medical investigator, very highly esteemed, uh, he described going to a party at a friend's house. It was four houses away, and on the way back, the police stopped him and had him face down on the sidewalk um, as he was trying to go to his house, which was three doors down, and the police wouldn't believe him. So I'm wondering if sometimes social exploration results in death and whether or not that might be one of the reasons that uh, some groups might be very wary of social exploration. Well, yeah, um, that's a rather dramatic example. Yeah, but, but, um, yeah, but I said that the majority of segregation, by which I mean a lack of opportunity for that sort of diffusion of ideas is behavioral. And it's exactly that sort of thing, right? It's these cultural things where I don't feel comfortable there. If I go in there, people are going to hassle me. Hopefully, they're not going to like throw you down on the ground and blah, blah, blah. But, but there are a lot less extreme versions of that. Um, and we've all experienced this, right? Uh, uh, some groups experience it a lot more. And in particular, they experience not feeling comfortable among higher uh, uh, among groups that have more opportunity than they do, which means they don't hear about opportunities. They don't get included in the conversation. Now, this isn't all the problems in the world. You can't, I mean, uh, just from the way you posed that, I suspect you're looking for a silver bullet. I don't have a silver bullet. What I do have is something that is a functional description of a lot of the things that people talk about when they say uh, uh, structural racism or structural uh, uh, problems of various sorts. But these are structural problems between communities of people who have adopted cultures or attitudes that cause the diffusion not to happen. And so that's why I was saying it would be really good to have ways to cause, uh, support that sort of diffusion. And of course, it's really difficult when uh, those sorts of uh, things build up. I'm going to make myself vaguely unpopular here. Uh, so I, we did a, a study recently that was replicated at Stanford uh, about uh, uh, hate in politics and extremism. And uh, the result of it was people on the left are just as errorful, screwed up, as people on the right. People in this audience will generally not believe that, but you can look it up. It's validated. What's the difference is, is not about facts, per se, but about it claims about intent. So that the, the rabble-rousers among us, uh, which unfortunately <laughs> include a lot of politicians, uh, make these claims about intent. And as we know from legal things, legal proceedings, proving intent is really hard. So if they say, oh, these guys are going to eat our babies, you don't have any evidence about it, and you tend to believe it. And what we discovered was a very short intervention about in intent, right, could uh, fairly radically depolarize people and get them to change their voting. Five minute intervention online. And so everyone's very excited about that and thinking about where it's going. It's, it's not like ready for prime time yet, but, but it, it's really interesting to think about intent and what we believe about other people that isn't necessarily so. And I think in this particular case as well, the timing and social context of the time at which the experiment is done impl impacts tremendously the result that you're going to get. If your colleagues does it today, same place, different time, different context, the data is going to be different. So the importance of social context at a very specific point in time oh. uh, is very important as well. We'll switch sides here and go on the right side of the room. I'm Susan Graham from Berkeley. Um, in your discussion of social exploration and the use of AI um, to, to help with it. Um, one of the effects is to empower people to improve their, um, their life, their situation, their circumstances. So is there some way that you can lower the age of those effects? In other words, 
Is there a way to empower children by using these ideas? I think absolutely, yeah. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, um, kids are among the most uh, voracious social learners, particularly if you think of what kids have to learn. And particularly as they hit puberty, you know, it's, it, they are, that's 90% of everything. It, it sort of, uh, that's just a made up number, but you know. And so I think that there is a, a real uh, need for that sort of thing. So some of my colleagues, for instance, uh, point out that particularly at that age, you get this impression that everybody is this way or that way. And it's generally not true. And I, I mean, you can fill in the slots yourself, right? Um, and so having a more realistic perception of what people are, where they're going, what really is uh, normative behavior um, could be really important at those things. I think a lot of the sort of, uh, uh, <laughs> like with my own kids, we gave them you know, sort of interactive uh, mystery type games really early on, like age four and stuff like that. But where the behavior was uh, curiosity, where the behavior was uh, honesty, where the, I mean, you know, we, we brainwashed the little suckers. <laughs> yeah. And, and how, would, how would we extend that to communities that don't have the kind of parental uh, advantages that, that your kids have? So, yeah, I mean, it's going to take a, a, a bunch of changes which are hard, like, for instance, changing educational systems. It's going to require, like many of the things, that we develop um, uh, financial models that work. So, for instance, social media is like, you know, oh, come on. It's, all this advertising revenue is just driving it to be berserk. Um, we see some places where these types of tools uh, are supported uh, as part of the medical system, right? Uh, for instance, I've been part of one of the spin-offs that we have um, empowers uh, nurse midwives uh, to go and be that common sense for uh, young mothers and for babies. At one point they treated, uh, they helped 10% of the, all the births in the world. Right? And then India took over a lot of it. But, but the point is, is there are ways of reaching people. Uh, they don't have to rely on advertising or software sales. We think of those things because they're so prominent. But uh, actually a lot of them are effective ones. Uh, this, that's a medical model. Another thing that we did is work with several countries in Latin America to reform their social programs. They had social programs that gave money to young mothers that took their kids in for shots and went to school and stuff like that. And, and they were uh, very biased in who they delivered those uh, uh, benefits to. So we built a tool that allowed the policymakers to see just how screwed up they were. And they indeed made it quite a bit better. So, so, so this is something where they already determined that this was a good investment for the government. Uh, and what we need to do is make the case that, that this thing we're talking about is a good investment too. Maybe that's the way forward. Thank you. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, data informed policy is, is better informed today than it ever was. And this is also where, as we bridge the gap between engineering and society, uh, the NAE and many of its members have insights and provide advice to the nation, including in education and not just in engineering. So education yep. is part, part of the solution there. We'll switch again, go on the left side of the room, please. Oh, yes. David Robinson from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So during the course of the peak COVID pandemic, we saw huge inequities in vaccine distribution. Well, namely, you know, folks here, were, we're in, the, in this country, we're approaching 70% vaccinated people on the continent of Africa, less than 7% had received access to vaccines. This tended to correlate not just with income level of the country, but also with the country had domestic onshore vaccine manufacturing capabilities. So we're holding an event in two weeks to look at how AI and large language models in particular could help uh, improve the ability or the knowledge base for folks who manufacture vaccines. What advice do you have for us to make that a successful effort in terms of trying to use AI and large language models 
to help advance vaccine manufacturing. Help the manufacturing you're talking about? Yes. Um, I think the short answer is I don't know enough about it to do anything more than guess. Um, but uh, one, I mean, one of the strengths of these things um, is that you can collect, you can get a, a holistic view that is otherwise impossible. The sort of things we do for problems like that, like we work on carbon and stuff like that, is you can do um, auditing without sharing data. We've just released a tool for doing these AI tools without releasing, without endangering private data. So this is AI without the danger of having your data leak. And those may be, and to me, that's a, that's a really critical limitation of today's technology. Uh, and so, I mean, to use the words, it's a combination of uh, uh, secure multi-party and inverse set indexing that allows you to figure out what things are relevant and, uh, and figure out what are the sort of better ways to do things, uh, but without endangering all of the private data of the participants. Uh, that's, I guess, the, the thing I would say. <laughs> Please. Yes, yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Ken Huang. I'm CEO of distributedapps.ai. It's a boutique AI consulting firm. I also publish a few books on AI, uh, blockchain, Web3, and cybersecurity by Wiley and Splinger. Uh, my question is on the leverage decentralized autonomous organization, or DAW, in your area of research or in social physics. Is it possible? If it's so not run, possible, what need to be changed? Yeah, so I run a thing called law.mit.edu, which is sort of a nationwide, uh, worldwide collection of lawyers who are thinking about things like this. Mm -hmm. And go look at it. They're, they are really interested in engaging to people. One of my guys uh, helped author the uh, Montana law on DAOs. And uh, we work with, for instance, Stanford's Kodaks and other people. Uh, you know, the, the, sh the short thing about DAOs, right, is that uh, the, he says decentralized autonomous organizations. Yes. So it's like it's computer code that runs things, right? You know, mm. uh, lawyer, uh, lawyers and uh, legislators are not willing to do that yet. There always has to be somebody who's responsible, and it has to be audited. Uh, and, uh, and if you have those two things, then people are willing to experiment with it. We could probably talk more about it because um, there's a lot of technical things that I could yeah, I thank you very to much. people, but I don't want to get out of my depth. In yeah, I just else. have a follow-up question. There's swarm intelligence, some people doing this kind of research, kind of called a swarm intelligence, right? It's like... Uh, if the majority of people goes in this flow, you follow up. So how this can be also uh, be in incorporated with the door, also with your research, uh, is it possible? Or <laughs> oh, I'm I think just that's thinking, a longer thinking too wide. <laughs> Sorry? I think that's a longer conversation. The, the, right, right. The swarms okay. are usually structured if they involve humans right. and... Uh, and so forth, yeah. Cool, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, as we switch here, for context, note the information here displayed on the screen. Feel free to reach out to uh, Sandy thereafter for technical questions, please. Yes, my name is Wang Chu. I'm from Purdue University. I spent 32 years at the University of Illinois. I also went to MIT. Uh, the thing I learned to share with you is that I have been very interested in why different minority groups perform differently across the country, for instance. Can you speak up a little? Because I'm having a little trouble, and I don't want to misunderstand you. OK, I'm very interested in why different minority groups are performed differently across the social group. For instance, I was at the University of Illinois. I read in a newspaper that Chinese minorities did well in school or on the campus is because they like to share knowledge. And they want to work together, whereas if you have under represented minorities like blacks and his, Hispanics, they don't share knowledge. So they don't do well in school. So yeah, those are common so, sense knowledge, but 
some cultures don't share them. Okay. So, so the, I recommend the social physics book. You know, humans um, have two types of social that they need, and those two types of social are in conflict. So one is, is you need what's called uh, bonding capital. In other words, people who are like you that help validate your ideas or, or winnow them out can contribute evidence. It's, it's your buds, right? Um, and that's particularly important when you're in a challenging situation. But you also need what's known as bridging capital, which is relationships that are between communities, because that's how you get new ideas and access to new skills and things like that. And, and those two are a little bit in conflict with each other, right? And what, uh, when you see communities that are, are closed off like that, often uh, they're feeling pressure of various sorts, particularly if they're disadvantaged communities. And they're just trying to stay along, so they stick with the bonding capital and don't have a lot of time for the, uh, the bridging capital. Uh, and then there are um, you know, more negative uh, reasons for people to retract some of the, the connections too. But um, you know, the, the way I think about these is I say, well, like, look, um, you know, 200,000 years ago is not that long in terms of evolutionary history. And back then we were tribes, small tribes, small groups that, that, that foraged and, and dig in. Foraging is exactly this exploration activity. It's built into our DNA in a very deep way, most animals forage, well, social animals certainly do this type of thing. And then they would come together into somewhat larger groups. Uh, and uh, there would sometimes be conflict, but it was really important, both for exchange of uh, 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 DNA, but also for exchange of new technologies and new opportunities. And so we, we are built with this sort of conflict of you know, our, our gang versus everybody else. Uh, and and you know you have to figure out ways to mediate that uh, conflict so that everybody has opportunities uh, while avoiding the, the story of the uh, woman that was up here about getting thrown down out of the ground. You know, it seems that your research can help sell uh, maybe popular, popular best practices and common sense to different minority groups so that. Uh, they can well, do well in this society. Yeah, I mean, I, I was talking this morning with a woman who runs a, a social empowerment uh, program. She's probably going to kick me later for calling it that. But basically what it's doing is it's training minority groups and underprivileged groups uh, in the ropes of how you get around in the world because they haven't gotten the skills to go out and, you know, kick government in the knee and say, pay attention. They need to have... Those, they need to be trained in that, whereas people from more affluent uh, groups tend to see that uh, demonstrated within their community, so they sort of learn it implicitly. So that's definitely, yeah. Yeah, this is also why as, as educators, right, we have opportunities as we train people to encourage them to reach out across diverse social networks, academic networks, exactly. scientific networks, and social networks. So it's very much part of that. I would encourage you to read um, Dr. Pedlin's book. We'll switch to the other side of the room, please, and we have about five minutes left. Jim Trichard, co-founder of National Instruments. If you were to ask an all-wise AI system, what are the top ways AI could go awry over the next decade, what would you say? I did say we have five minutes left, just for context, <laughs> please. Well, first of all, I, I don't even know what the concept of all-wise means. Uh, and I was at a dinner with a venture capitalist a couple of nights ago, and he said, we live in an age when general artificial intelligence is going to come within our lifetimes. And I called him on it, because I don't think that's true. I think that this stuff that we have here is, is the this, this stuff we have is really interesting because it proves how limited people are. If you can just simply you know, look at all the transition probabilities between the things we say to each other and sound like a person, then that means that Tversky was right, uh, is that most of what we do is largely automatic and learned from our interaction with others. Uh, so how can it go wrong? You can go wrong in lots of ways. Uh, you ought to ask him. He works with CRISPR. 
If I was going to be scared of anything, I'd be free. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, I didn't mean to jump no, no, in. No, no, Is it the guy who sits in the office next to me who thinks about how do you actually <laughs> look at things? And well, we should talk about that because some of the stuff I just said is a good way to look for for bad guys in CRISPR. Yeah, I mean, and and, and I think we have to to remember that there are many ways to do things wrong. We don't need AI to tell us how to do that. No. We've done a pretty good job in the past. Historically, we've done a good job about that in politics as well and beyond. So we'll we'll just take that at a break. Uh, time for a few more questions, please. On, on the left. I'm Baron Chirou at uh, Stanford University. Thanks for the talk, Sandy. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of trust and how you would fit this into the framework that you presented? Is that something that's already implicitly embedded in this uh, Bayesian term uh, that captures uh, social exploration as, a, as your decision-making prior, or, or would that be an extension uh, of the whole formulation? It's a little bit of an extension, but here's what the data uh, uh, are that, that I've seen. One is, first of all, we, we took a community, uh, uh, young families mostly, uh, and uh, they signed up for this, so don't criticize. We, we watched everything for a year, right? Including asking them trust questions, like would you let this person watch your baby? Would you loan this person your car? Would you loan them 100 bucks? And it turns out you can predict the answers to those questions almost perfectly by how often do they reciprocally interact with each other. So in other words, if I reach out to you, that means I think that you're valuable to me. But if you reach out back, then I'm valuable to you. And if we both do that, then that seems to be the basis of a, a trust relationship. That could be weird, you know, like I trust you to misbehave, or I trust you only in some areas, or things like that. And what we find, this was in the, the National Academy of Science paper, is, is that um, people preferentially trim their social uh, uh, interactions uh, to be able to have better performance, basically. So when you find people that have a similar utility function, uh, trading information with them benefits both of you more. So there is this idea of you take this, this prior and you say, well, what I'm going to do is have relationships with people that will give me, given my utility function, the best prior. That, that sounds like it's experimentally really, really hard to separate, you know, the actual interaction patterns. No, from, I mean, the, we the, have a, we have a, a, a machine learning trust. paper mm -hmm. that talks about that. So what you're doing is you're trying to estimate what you can do in this sort of network mm -hmm. of collaborating uh, banded agents, multi-armed banded agents. Is you can try to um, estimate their utility function on the fly mm -hmm. by looking at their behavior. Because, of course, they'll pull arms that are more useful to them. Yeah. And if that agrees with your anticipation, then they have a similar utility function. And so based on that, you weight them more as people that you trust. I mean, it's not like, yeah, I mean, trust has like all these romantic things on top of it, and I'm not talking about all that. But, but we have a pretty good handle on it. It's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's along the themes of people aren't that complicated. <laughs> We just look complicated. Especially engineers. Especially engineers. Especially engineers. All right, briefly here, we have three more people standing up, so I'll give you guys a chance to ask a question. If you can be brief and expect a quick answer, please. Panos Papalambros, University of Michigan. Uh, listening to your fascinating talk, I was uh, reminded of the uh, 1973 paper by Ritter and Weber on wicked problems. Mm. And you know, they were causing, uh, uh, cautioning us against the arrogance of trying to use OR models to solve social problems. And so I'm thinking today, you're solving, you're trying to solve social problems, and what is that we've done better now? Do we have better math, better computers, better understanding of humans, or is it more data? I think uh, it's probably all of the above. Um, so we have more, I mean, like for instance, I showed this sort of, you know, uh, citations moving towards, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 
one of the guys they're doing says it uses all of the, all of the uh, GPUs in Illinois to do that. <laughs> it's not an easy, yeah. But um, I tried to give you a sense of what the, the better mathematical models are, and they actually work. I mean, they work, they're not perfect. I'm not saying that, right? But, but they give you uh, something that is good enough to optimize and get a result that is fairly reliable, and particularly with respect to extrema events like uh, cascades and, and, and so forth. Uh, because it's building that, cascade events come from people paying attention to each other, a preferential attachment. And you have to build that into your model if you're going to be able to deal with that class of uh, extremal events. So I think that what we can do now is we have more complete models, we have more complete data, like I showed you that uh, vaccination uh, uh, thing, right? So we never had data like that before. Uh, uh, just the flows between counties, right? We just didn't have that. And uh, you couldn't, couldn't do it. And we didn't have the computers to do it either. So all of these things are coming together. The part that, you know, personally I push on is, is the better models and figuring out can we validate these and where are their edges. And um, I showed you some evidence about it. I wouldn't claim to know everything about it. Thank you. In the spirit of the theme of the day and socializing, I will stop questions now, give everybody an extra minute to socialize during the break. I'm going to thank Sandy for a thought-provoking, insightful lecture and humoring uh, the Q&A. I want to thank the pair and the, the committee and my fellow committee members uh, for their service in wisely selecting an insightful speaker, member of ours, for the special, uh, special lectures uh, presentation on engineering and society. Um, and I'm going to ask everyone to be back here in 30 minutes at 4 o'clock sharp to attend the celebration of our former NAE president, Bill Wolf's uh, legacy. So thank you all for your participation today. <laughs> <laughs>